in national cuisine. So when I, when I looked at this, I said, okay, so what happens when food gets into the city? Well, seasonality becomes less visible. You're in the city, you're not in the countryside, so you don't always know uh, what vegetables are ready, what fruit is ready, what fish is in the ponds. Um, seasonal produce also becomes less accessible because you're not in the countryside. You, you cannot immediately get something as soon as it's ripe. You have to wait until the logistics of the market bring it to your local area. And of course, lifestyle changes. People have less time. Uh, they're less willing to cook. Um, perhaps the, there isn't a dedicated cook in the house anymore, so they have their, their, the division of labor makes it difficult to spend a lot of time cooking. And yeah, things change. The availability of spices in the city, such as MSG, uh, such as meat, these change the way that, that food is, is prepared. And of course, in the city, certain food will just be forgotten or ignored, and we can't really know why. It, food became unpopular, but certain dishes seem to disappear when they make the transition from the countryside to the city. So I kept all these things in mind when I said, when I looked at how can I study a soup pot restaurant. Okay. So then I started, I said, let's pick up a few places that capture the different regions, uh, the regional tastes. So I picked soup pot restaurants that represent different provinces. And I also picked soup pot restaurants to look at that um, that are spread around the city of Phnom Penh. So you capture really poor areas, well, better off areas, middle class areas, and everything in between. I'll show you um, a, a, a map of Phnom Penh soon with that. Okay. But I also had to kind of define what would be a soup pot restaurant because there's a, there, the, that, the line between a soup pot restaurant and other formats of restaurant is not so clear. So I told myself, okay, this would be my running definition. These are the working class uh, version of rural culinary traditions. They have to be the sort of inexpensive version, family run, no chains. Um, and I understood that most of them only will serve breakfast and lunch, although I did also study a few that serve dinner time. And they all have to serve pre-prepared food. Everything is in a, a pot already there. And the menu has to be more or less rotating. So the food has to be something that is changing every day based on seasonality, cost, and variety. And in the end, I also wanted to interview the people who go to these restaurants and other types of restaurants to find out what the general behavior is for dining in Cambodia, to see how dining relates to retention of idea of national cuisine. So I surveyed diners uh, who go to diff all sorts of different types of restaurants all combined. Uh, whether they go to a soup pot restaurant, a to-order restaurant, which is one that you can order whatever food you want uh, after you arrive, a cafe, nightlife places, snack places, and places that are slightly more modern, but they're definitely still oriented towards Khmer uh, clientele. I also spent quite a few months with the owners of soup pot restaurants, in this case 10 of them, uh, spending time in their restaurants and going with them to the markets where they buy vegetables and, and fruit, especially the morning markets. They usually go around 4 o'clock in the morning or 4.30 in the morning, and it's a big adventure to see a restaurant owner buy materials for an entire day. And the way and the, the logic that they use to, um, to make their purchase, I'll, visit, I'll revisit that a little bit later. So these are the research sites. I'm sorry that it can't be clear, but I have sites that stretch from Takamao all the way to George and um, and also out to Po Jintong. The blue ones are to order restaurants. They are the, the ones where you can essentially order anything off of the menu after you arrive. And I, in, there was about 10, 9 of them, and the soup pot restaurants are the ones in red. And I spent time at around 15 of them scattered around the city over a course of around eight months. So this is what I found. It turns out that in general, um, the Han Bai, which is a category of Khmer food restaurant that includes the soup pot and the order restaurants, are the most beloved restaurants, even no matter what class, age, um, or employment you're in. These restaurants are the all-conquering uh, 
dining experience in Phnom Penh. Everybody goes there, and people go there in the course of a week quite a lot. Now these are averages, so there are some people that go every day, and there are some people that never go, but you get the idea that, for example, people in the poorest socioeconomic class, they still go to soup pot restaurants three times a week on average. But they don't go to order restaurants very often in a week. Lower middle class, they are the largest uh, customers of soup pot restaurants. Um, but middle and upper class are still going quite often to soup pot restaurants. I also looked at their behavior towards going to branded restaurants, which are chain restaurants, malls or food courts, uh, tourist restaurants, uh, snack food places, nightlife places and cafes. Um, but in general, what I found, and it's hard to compare this with other countries, but at least from my perspective, it seemed very much like that dining in Cambodia is a very popular thing. Poorest people will still go out to some extent uh, five times per week, and they'll go out for meals 3.4 times per week. That's quite a lot. Yeah. Which one are your tourist restaurants? Sorry? What kind of restaurant tourist restaurants? No, the, here the data is based on me interviewing them and asking them how many times in a week or how many times in the last month they've gone to tourist restaurants and trying to triangulate the general behavior of going to tourist restaurants. But I didn't actually go to visit any tourist restaurants. I just... Uh, no, uh, the KFC would be in the branded restaurant category. The tourist restaurant would be like, you know, a foreign cuisine, French cuisine, or, you know, um, or European cuisine, American cuisine, anything like that. We see upper class, they go out quite a lot. They eat out quite a lot, but they also drink out quite a lot. Um, the beginning, and I'm gonna, oh, let me analyze this a little bit for you. Um, generally, I would, I would point out that one thing that you can notice about the soup pot restaurants is that, and this is, this is critical for my argument, they're very egalitarian. Rich people go and poor people go. I mean, yes, rich people go less, but they still go very often. And these are not clean and hygienic places necessarily, but rich people are still going there quite often. Um, naturally, the middle class and the poorest of, the, if, of all the places that they go to, uh, soup pot restaurants or hand by are generally the most uh, common, but still, in the, for the upper classes, it's quite common. And in general, if you look at soup pot restaurants, they represent 56% of all the dining in Phnom Penh. That's it. They, they, one out of every two times somebody will go out, whether it's a cafe or nightlife, they're going to go to one of these places. So this is the institution for eating here. I mean, there's no doubt about it. And what do people, what do people like about it? Why is it so popular? I tried to work on that. Well, the atmosphere is family-like. You know, it's. Uh, it's not so anonymous. When you walk into one of these places, uh, you know they'll ask you, oh, what, what do you want? And the family will greet you. And sometimes they're grumpy if they had a bad day. Sometimes they're very nice. It really, but the experience is a family experience. And people like them because they're very egalitarian. And I found this in my, uh, in my data. These are different jobs. You can't see them very clearly, but it's housewife, student, teacher, civil servant, office worker. Etc. Etc. The most, the largest group is self-employed, but that is a large category. It includes many people. But generally, people who go to soup pot restaurants are represented across the employment spectrum. Everybody goes, and every age group goes. Young kids go, teenagers, you know, twenty-year-olds go, thirty-year-olds go, and older people go in fairly equal proportions. So this, these types of restaurants really are the meeting place for every person in Phnom Penh, every class of society. And um, looking back on what I said in the beginning, yes? Sorry, you said that the people like them because they're egalitarian. Do you mean that they are egalitarian? Like people have said that that's what they do with them? I think that it's hard for me to judge whether they like them because they're egalitarian, but in general, uh, they are kind of class-free space. It seems like you know anybody, any employment, any age, any class, socioeconomic class, don't have any uh, hesitation about going to a place like this, despite the fact that it is not 
that actually if you had the money you could upgrade to a better restaurant. It still maintains that egalitarian ethos. And if I had found a pattern, I would happily report it. I was looking for a pattern, but what I found is that there is no pattern. Everybody goes to these restaurants. And, and I, it wasn't unusual for me to have experiences where I would sit down to do my research uh, across the table from somebody, and it turns out that he's some millionaire. He just stopped in for lunch. And then behind me are like two dirty construction workers or motel repair guys. And they're just sitting basically right next to each other. Maybe they won't share a table together, but they're in the same restaurant. Now, I also have data, which I won't present here, which shows how often um, the different socioeconomic groups take to go food from these restaurants. But in general, you'll find that, yes, poor people sit in more, and rich people tend to take food away. But it's still, the to-go is at a maximum only around 33%. Most people go and sit inside the restaurant. Um, now, in my large sample of 120 people, eight people qualified as very rich, um, which doesn't seem like a lot, but actually proportionate to the amount of rich people that there is in Phnom Penh, that is actually very, uh, that is matching the general demographic trend which is around, you have very upper class people representing around 5%. So in this case, in the case of my data, is around 6%. So rich people are definitely going there, and many of them, and rich people in my definition here is anybody who makes $2,000 a month or above, or had jobs that were obviously very, very high level, like you know, four-star generals or owners of large businesses. And they would eat food just like everybody else. That was a big surprise to me. And I think now I'll try and move into some of the characteristics that may explain why people love these food places. Um, one is that, as I said, this is, these places are at the cusp of the transition between the rural countryside and the city. <coughs> and so they are the closest mimic to the way food is, and eating customs in the countryside. So for example, here's the ideal balancing meal at a typical spot restaurant. If I go to eat, 90% of the time my food will look like this. rice soup, something fried, pickles, and tea. This is what you need to have a balanced digestion. And the owner will make sure that this happens. <coughs> and there's additional research um, in Cambodia and also outside that talks about how this balanced system is actually developed. It turns out that, yes, we can imagine the uh, Khmer have been developing their cuisine for thousands of years. Uh, and definitely since Angkor. And so probably they've found a good nutritional balance in the cuisine. And we know that that is possibly coming from the nutrition and diversity of rice aquatic systems, which is typical for Cambodia. And we now know that if you look at homestead food, despite the fact that the, there are low calories, sometimes in poor households, the food in terms of micronutrients and vitamins and protein is well balanced. So if they could increase the amount, the amount of food they're eating, it would be a very balanced food. So the soup pot restaurant is copying the homestead food model and serving it to you on an everyday basis in a semi-professional way. And this is coming from a long line of Khmer cuisine, which is to say that based on the very, very healthy aquatic ecosystem. Of course, Cambodia is blessed with a lot of fish, which is a, a major contributor here. But even if it didn't have as much fish as they did, it would still be healthy, because this research looked at places like Vietnam, Thailand, Laos, and China. Um, I also found in my interviews uh, the narrative that people like the Sukhwat restaurant, even rich people, because it maintains a thrifty ideal. Right. So here is a middle class guy, middle class meaning he makes about $500 a month. And he's, in, he's age 55. And he says, the only reason that I can accept uh, for a lunch price to go up is if the owner gives more food or makes better quality food. I don't want to pay for fancy tables, chairs, and bowls. Um, that's a very practical orientation to eating. He's saying food and quantity is the only thing that you should really pay for. And now this guy was in middle age, 55, but there are also conversations in which ideas about this thriftiness are embedded in dialogue with rich, 
lower middle class and the poorest. Everybody appreciates the fact that these places are not, uh, they don't have any bells and whistles. They're not fancy or special. They are just about eating food every day. They are routine. And that was my original question in the beginning. How can we capture routine diversity? There's another thing that people like about these, and I think what may, keeps them propped up for families, is that they are useful for culinary learning. Now, I wrote a thesis more in depth on this, but uh, if we just look at the perspective of, uh, let's say, uh, a family with children, uh, or somebody who's an immigrant from the countryside, what these places are useful for is constantly exposing yourself and re-exposing yourself to the diversity of cuisine, because these places rotate their food every day. So in theory, if you went every day, you would experience new food every meal for you know, a period of some weeks or a month. Now, I have some very specific data about that shortly. But let's look at another thing which brought uh, certain demographics in. In this case, it was a housewife with her son. They were eating together. And she says that she was happy that her son is here, even though he wants to eat burgers, but she can let him try new kinds of soup, and importantly, foods that she doesn't make at home. So this enables her to expose her son to foods that she otherwise would not be able to make, but are still important for her in their cuisine. And then she was very proud that her little boy, who's 10 years old, removed all the bones from the fish, a type of fish that he had never tried before until that day. So a 10-year-old is getting lessons on how to debone fish. Now, you know, if you've ever struggled with deboning a really difficult freshwater fish from the Tony Sap, you know it's not very easy to do. And knowing this skill is important for being able to eat on a daily basis in Cambodia. And learning this can be done at these soup pot restaurants as well. Later in the conversation, she also mentions that you know, she likes this place because the boy is not tempted only by Coca-Cola, but also by coconut water and sugar cane juice. So there's something about consuming regional or countryside fresh products that goes with uh, going to these authentic uh, Khmer Supa restaurants. Um, there's another thing which is sort of hidden behind this, uh, which is that these places are actually, uh, contrary to popular belief, improving their hygiene very rapidly. The places that I interviewed, many of them were in the process of improving their hygiene, had already improved it, or were already at a, uh, at a level that, they, that was as high as they could go without spending additional money and causing the price of the food to go up. And the typical things that they do now, not all places will do this, but sanitizing dishes and cutlery, um, measures to keep flies away, to avoid food spoilage, maintaining certain temperatures, um, and cleaning using cleaning liquid on tables. The last one is the one that's the least common in Canada. And you'll see, you know, in a certain sense, these, these efforts appear everywhere. Uh, this is boiled water with uh, the cutlery in it. The table, in this case, was cleaned with uh, a cleaning solution. And it was a stainless steel table, which is very hygienic. And not all places have this, but places are generally trying to reach this because they are small interventions that don't cost the cost of the food to go up. Another reason that people like these, and what makes it interesting for somebody like me who's looking at how national cuisine is being shaped, is that the menu follows a kind of housewife logic, right? So you have to rotate the food for regular customers. Now, regular customers could also be your family. You don't want to feed your family the same food every day. Logic number two, you have to prepare food that people generally expect to encounter in that season. Don't buy out-of-season produce and try it to force that on people. And that's connected to the third logic, which is that you want to buy the cheapest produce. And the cheapest produce tends to be seasonal. Although sometimes, uh, especially for certain types of vegetables that are not commonly grown in Cambodia at this scale, this is imported as well. And generally, I would say a family would operate along this logic. They would say, OK, we, we can make food that people expect because it's that time of year. Uh, we don't want to bore our family with the same food all the time, but we need to be very thrifty about which food we buy, so we have to buy only seasonal things. And so I looked at this. I said, okay, let me try and figure out 
are these soup pot restaurants really seasonal or not? But I had to compare it to something, so we have no basis for comparison. So I compared it to, to order restaurants. So the soup pot restaurant has pre-prepared food, and to order a restaurant has uh, food that you can order on demand. Now, if you look, the when I go on shopping trips, I look very closely what they buy. So this is the, the basis of my research on the amount of you know, based on the kilos that they bought for different products. The soup pot restaurants will get around 73% seasonal or local produce. And for order restaurants, around 56%. Now there's a reason for that, it'll come up later. It has to do with using non-typical non vegetables. Um, in terms of fruit, more or less they're the same, uh, but they use quite a lot of seasonal fruit. Uh, beef here is all local and seasonal. That's Cambodia, that's pretty typical of pork. Of course, much of it is coming from Thailand, and so there's not much of a difference there. But in fish, you see a big difference. In fish, you see that the soup pot restaurant uses around 57% um, aquaculture, and the order restaurant uses 73% aquaculture, which means that they're using 43% fresh fish that they're getting from the ponds or from uh, other farmers or from the sea. And in the wet season, uh, soup pot restaurants get 78% of their uh, fish from fresh water sources. Whereas to order restaurants tend to be very consistent, want to be very consistent in which type of fish they have on order. And so they buy more aquaculture. Uh, in the case of eggs, it was about the same. But you see there are a few characteristics here that suggest that the soup pot restaurant tends to use more uh, seasonal products, especially vegetables and fish. So let's take this comparison a little bit further, okay? Here's the soup pot restaurant on the left, and it's a water restaurant on the right. In a two pot restaurant, and that's a restaurant that has two big silver pots in front of it, which is to say they can serve two soups on that day, they'll produce an average of 11 unique types of food per week, and in a month, 28 types of food per week. And a three-pot restaurant, which has slightly more capacity for, for doing and dishes, can produce around 15 different unique dishes per week and 40 dishes per month. And by month, this will also evolve. But the average price, 155, always with rice, sometimes dessert. This one I'll address in a minute. But let's look at order restaurants. It's not easy to compare exactly because to order restaurants don't have pots. But what you can see is if you look at the top five foods that Cambodian people order, like sour soup with morning glory, or uh, you know, snout jewel, you know, lemon sour soup, or uh, lok lak or something, the top five dishes are ordered 49% of the time, which suggests that when somebody walks into a restaurant, they're fairly boring. They order the same food all the time. And when you go to the top 10 dishes, it's only 63% it's of the food. Which means that when you come into a restaurant and you don't see the food in front of you, and you have to think, what do I want today? You're not very creative. And as a result, you don't get exposed to 40 different types of food in a month. Now, 40 is a lot. That's a lot of learning there. Now, to order restaurants are also more expensive. And here's another issue. To order restaurants use very few non-standard vegetables compared to soup pot restaurants. So non-standard vegetables are those that, that are not used in most of the cuisine. There's a special type of soup, let's say a soup with uh, banana flowers or a soup with um, um, tamarind leaves or a soup with uh, lotus, uh, lotus stems in it. These are non-standard vegetables and you have to design a food around them. To order restaurants, we do not like to have these types of vegetables in their store because nobody ever orders it. But soup pot restaurants, they can decide on a rotating basis what they want to cook and they have a lot more opportunity to use these vegetables. And these vegetables are uh, more seasonal and they're more local. They're more, usually you get them from Cambodia. So let's visualize this. Okay. So here's, a, here's one of the more dramatic, you know, views of a soup pot restaurant, right? They have a lot of dishes. This is not a three pot soup pot restaurant. This is like a 15 pot restaurant. And you have these. And if you go here, you 
It's like a museum of what they have seen, and every day it will change slightly. Here's a slightly smaller version. This is only the four-pot restaurant. But you can see the benefit of this is that you can really kind of put your nose into something, look at it, say, oh, I'm really in the mood for this, or oh, I forgot about eating that for a long time. The soup-pot restaurant, working as a housewife, allows you to completely be re-exposed every time you walk in the channel to all the different diversity of Cambodian cuisine. And to order restaurants or other restaurant formats where they hide the dishes in the back, they don't provide this level of transparency. So let's get to the end of this. What, what am I, you know, I started with the idea of national cuisine, I moved into uh, a soup pot restaurant and why people like it, why it's the most common uh, type of, um, of dining experience here, how it's an egalitarian setting. So on a micro level you can you can definitely conclude that soup pot restaurateurs, these guys, all over Phnom Penh and other urban areas, they fulfill two simultaneous uh, goals. One, they, they actually create demand for new kinds of food, and they also push the supply. They go to the vegetable markets, and they're the ones who indirectly contribute to the demand for those types of vegetables from farmers. So farmers in Cambodia will continue to grow, let's say, uh, lotus stems and sell them because they're demanded in Phnom Penh. Somebody needs to demand them, otherwise the farmer will stop producing them. Supot restaurants do that. So regional produce and regional cuisines are uh, both supplied and demanded through this model. I looked at the culinary learning here. Children are exposed to the diversity of Khmer cuisine when they're young, they learn culinary skills, and adults, when they go, their, their um, awareness of the Khmer cuisine is refreshed. I also pointed out that they operate in a very uh, culturally specific way, usually following fairly rural customs <coughs> in the city. Um, and that is generally centered around balance, that you have to have a soup, you have to have something fried, you have to have some pickles, and something to wash it down with, usually tea. And these are class three venues uh, or egalitarian venues that are comfortable for immigrants. And immigrants are those who are in that transition from the countryside to the city, are the ones who are deciding what type of food would make sense to eat in the city, given the market conditions, given how busy they are and everything. But they're also still relevant for upper class urbanites, which suggests that there's an enduring appeal to the soup pot restaurants that even rich people can can see, despite perhaps some hygienic lapses. Now, if we jump to the bigger conclusions, what I would like to take out of this, uh, and I will, you know, this will be the focus of the next uh, month or two of my writing, is that I now view these soup pot restaurants as kind of urban brokers of rural food practices, regional food practices. And they are working in parallel to um, the rural to urban migrants who are cooking food at home. So I'm not excluding the relevance of home cooked food. I'm just saying that this soup pot restaurant works in parallel with them to maintain awareness and appreciation for agricultural products that are grounded in that location and that season. And these soup pot restaurants, compared to other formats, are really at the forefront of shaping this national cuisine by their routine curating, like a, in a museum, of the diversity of Khmer food. These people decide every day based on what they can get in the market, based on what people like, based on uh, making something new, what to cook. And they're really the ones who are either going to decide whether a certain dish dies out or maintains uh, popularity. So, this is my last slide. What is the, the relevance of this? Okay. Now, to put a little bit of a sort of nationalistic spin on it, but also to, to really ground it into some development-related issues that are very important, I would say that this, the development of the national cuisine in this sort of egalitarian way through soup pot restaurants are very democratic in the way that food is evolved. They're about protecting the Khmer cuisine. They are the ones who are really maintaining popularity of, of the diversity of the cuisine. And they're also the ones who, in general, 
are making the decisions what types of foods will disappear. Okay? But um, they're also in the process of either maintaining or destroying the nutritional and agroecological systems that go behind the food system. So the farmers and the types of vegetables that they grow, the types of meat that they grow, the type of fish that we harvest, these are all decided very much by these soup pot restaurants, which are a huge part of the demand of Kampen. And this is important because Cambodia is on the brink of more intensive industrialization, and we've seen in many other contexts that this very often leads to a serious decline in the diversity of food. So by watching places like this, we, they're kind of an indicator of what the stability is, what the health is of the Cambodian national food. And they're also the place that food researchers can look to see what, what really the demands are. I mean, not, not what's going on with tourists, not going on with cookbooks, which are all very artificial or superficial uh, representations of this, but what is going on for everyday people in their routine eating habits. So with that, I would like to, to end and open up for discussion. If you have any questions about these slides, let me know. I can also flip back. All right. So one question. Uh, has, have you counted uh, a lot of office uh, workers like me and others? We spend 40% of our time eating lunch buffet. Either we go on, uh, for example, the Canadian tower, a lot of people work down there, they go to eat lunch buffet there and don't go to the company center, they have buffet there and don't deal with the table. They also have a buffet there, we spend only two to the lunch, 50 and then we eat 10 items of food. Right. And also in the evening, uh, there is a growing number of the barbecue and the seafood. You can see more and more barbecue than really the, you know, yeah. like the swim and crab and so on. Have you include yeah. this? Okay, well first, your first one for Factory workers are still a big slice of this pie. And office workers are another big, are another big slice of this pie. Okay? Now, I would also say that the buffet restaurant is some, some, somewhere between a to-order restaurant and a soup pot restaurant. Um, because if you go there, you can pay for the buffet, but you can still just have one type of soup and one type of fried food or something. But in general, Cambodian cuisine is much easier to enjoy if you're with multiple people, because you always share everything family style. So whether you go to a soup pot restaurant with 10 people or to a buffet, you'll probably end up eating the same number of dishes. Because in a buffet, when you have 10 people, you'll probably take 10 or 12 dishes. If you go to a soup pot restaurant, each person will order whatever food they want, and it will all be shared. <coughs> the, the line between the buffet and the soup pot restaurant is, is, is definitely there, but the more people you have, the less relevant it is. And factory workers, office workers, they tend to go to eat at lunch, at least, in large groups. So you're right. Um, now, to look at... To look at the type, other types of food. Now, there's no doubt. I can't. I didn't. Nobody did this research before me, so I can't say what's changed in the last 10 years. But I can des definitely say that as you get more money or your income goes up, your demand for non soup pot restaurants uh, also goes up. But it doesn't necessarily hurt always your demand for the soup pot restaurant. Here, only in the case of the very upper classes, we're talking about really rich people. Has it, has there, is there any appreciable decline? But generally what you see is that all of these other alternative types of foods, uh, branded restaurants, mall food, tourist restaurants, snack, snack food is popular. You know? People like to go eat uh, fried meatballs or grilled beef or nomen chok or bang chow or all these other things. They like to go and do that. And I think this is an important part of the food landscape. But it's very hard to fit it into an idea of national cuisine because people snack in a very irregular way. But you have to eat three meals a day. So that's something that we can really look at in a routine sense. But yeah, at a very poor scale, snack is still important, but nightlife is a huge thing. So yeah, at nighttime, you know, people are, rich people are going out almost three times a week. That's a lot. Some guys who told me they go out seven days a week. Some guys told me they never go out, but unfortunately this is just the average here. But yeah, these are becoming much more popular, all these alternative versions, and in the future they will become popular. But 
a question that's still open for me, and maybe you guys can help answer it, especially some of the Kumai in the audience. <coughs> Will the demand for these other types of food and restaurants take away demand from soup pot restaurants and hand pie? I don't know yet, because I would need to do the study in the future and see if these numbers change. But at least at the current moment with this baseline, I can't say for sure. Julie? Um, have you tried the cow soup? I, I have tried the cow soup. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, it's not as bad as you think. It's just very grassy. Yeah. Didn't get it's hygienic though. I mean, I was fine after. <laughs> 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 I, I saw the cow blankets of the lamb food and only the Cambodian li Lumiere the Thai dish that they have in Thailand that they import the lamb food, you know? I mean, uh, if you ask them, they will say they're quiet, you know, they won't say they're loud. But that's the point. Regional food is very diverse. It's very hard to say, oh, this is not Khmer food. Well, you know, the borders in Southeast Asia have been changing for a long time. So to say that one thing is Cambodian or another thing is not based on the French border is not, not really going to be true. However, you can definitely say that the lowlands have different types of cuisine than uplands. But, and Laos tends to be a little more upland, so they have different food that comes there. Yes, back then. Um, I would like to ask you, uh, how did you analyze uh, your interviews? How have you been able to draw conclusions uh, from the interviews from the support uh, owners and from the customers? How did you draw the conclusions from, from the interviews? Uh, well, basically, um, for this type of work, because there was no clear guidelines for how to do it, I started out with a very grounded theory approach. And my interviews, of course, the first 10 or 15 never didn't quite get at the heart of the issues. But all of the conclusions, for example, the attributes of soup pot restaurants, these are based on interviews both with the people inside um, and also with the owners. The owner, for example, uh, might mimic the story of the customer. The customer says, I won't pay more food.